at the time, I mentioned that this is one of the two great New Testament passages dealing with reconciliation. Different ways of portraying our salvation, different aspects of it. But the aspect of reconciliation is dealt with primarily in Romans 5, 1 to 11, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I thought by way of quick review of what we saw last week, we would look not at Romans 5, but at that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The same points are made, though in a little different wording. But let's just take a minute to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and what Paul says about reconciliation there. I think Josh was referring to this passage on Sunday as well. We'll start at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There's another way of speaking of what has happened in Christ. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Okay, just very quickly, notice the following points. Number one, what causes the need for reconciliation? Well, clearly, it's our trespasses, our offenses, our sins, because they have to be done away. God has to not count them against us if we're to be reconciled with him. So that's where the problem lies with our offenses. Then, secondly, though we are the ones who offend and the breaking off of our good relations with God is all on us because human beings have sinned against God, God, the offended party, is nonetheless the one who takes the initiative to make reconciliation possible. Notice what Paul says in verse 18, all this is from God. God is the one who takes the initiative initiative to make it possible for us to be reconciled to him, even though we are the ones who offended. Next point. Oh, and by the way, on that, Paul is really turning things upside down. I mean, in principle, you can see that the person who causes the offense ought to be the one who is seeking reconciliation. But this is actually the way, this is also the way that Jews thought of their God and that pagans thought of their gods as well. If they had offended them in any way, they had to come up with how they can reconcile, or that, how they can appease their god, what sacrifices they can offer, what they can do to appease their god to make reconciliation possible. If you're the one who was offended, then you have to be the one to take the initiative. And of course, the gospel turns that upside down completely. We are the one who offend. We are the ones who offend. Therefore, we are at enmity, at hostility with God, but God is the one, the offended party is the one who takes the initiative to make it possible for us to be back on good terms with him, to be reconciled with him. Next point, what Christ does shows God's purposes. We saw this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now, the normal human way of thinking would be, if Christ died for us, that demonstrates Christ's love for us, right? But Paul puts it differently. God demonstrates his love for us in having his son die for us. And the same thing is true here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What Christ does is, in fact, God effecting his purposes through Christ. So in Christ... God was reconciling the world to himself. Christ is the means by whom, the one in whom God's purposes are seen. 
and the one through whom God reconciles the world to himself. Next point, God reconciles us to himself through Christ by not counting our sins against us. And he's able to do that because Christ became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's this great exchange between us as sinners, Christ as the righteous one, Christ bearing our sins so that we can be righteous as he becomes, as he takes on our sins himself. So what is necessary for our reconciliation to God is that God not count our trespasses against us, and he's able to do this because Christ became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's making the same point that we saw last week, that reconciliation and justification are very closely related, but they're not the same thing. Justification is a law court language. God, we're on trial before God. Are we innocent? Are we guilty before God? And our eternal destiny depends on the outcome of that trial. And God justifies us. God declares us righteous. God finds us innocent. God acquits us at the judgment because though we are sinners, Christ bore our sins for us so that God can rightly justify us. That's justification. It's a little different from reconciliation, which is the idea that we're at enmity with God and we need to be back in God's good books. But of course, justification is necessary for reconciliation because as long as we are not justified, as long as we are in our sins, God can't declare us righteous and we can't be on good terms with God. So it's only as God is able to declare us righteous because Christ has atoned for our sins. It's only because of justification that we can be reconciled to God. And so Paul is making the same point here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God doesn't count our sins against us because Christ bore them. That's justification. And therefore, we can be reconciled to God. But the final point to be made here, and it's an important one in 2 Corinthians 5, is that it remains for people... To, be, to accept this reconciliation. God has done through Christ what is necessary on his part for us to be reconciled to God. Christ has atoned for our sins. There's no longer any reason for us to be at enmity with God, provided we're willing to accept reconciliation. But of course, the whole problem that caused our need for reconciliation was our rebellion against God. And unless we're prepared to do away with that, unless we're prepared to lay down our arms, unless we're prepared to submit to his lordship, to be reconciled to him, then we remain in rebellion against him, then we remain at enmity with God. And so, though God has, through Christ, reconciled the world, we can say, in principle, to himself, it remains for us to accept that reconciliation, to lay down our arms, our rebellion against God, to submit to him in faith. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God so that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. God's grace is there, it's offered to you, but it's offered in vain if you're not prepared to, be, to lay down your arms, to lay down your rebellion against God and submit to his lordship. So there, in very brief summary, is what Paul says about reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5 repeating very much the same points that we saw in Romans chapter 5. So let's go on now tonight with Romans 5, starting at verse 12, and we'll see how far we get. Should have done this at the start, but that was a review, so at this point at least, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you will be our teacher by your Holy Spirit, that the word that you have inspired by your Holy Spirit will speak to us through your Holy Spirit so that we may understand it and that we may submit to it and rejoice in it as we read your word tonight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 5, 12 to 21 is the great passage in the New Testament and in fact the great passage in the whole Bible dealing with what theologians refer to as original sin. 
the sin of Adam and Eve, though the focus is here on Adam, and the consequences it bears for human beings. Now, it's important to say at the outright, at the outset, that though we talk about this as the great passage on original sin, that's not really where Paul's focus is. He says something about it, and it's important that we note what he says about it, but his real focus is on the comparison between Adam and Christ, and his real focus there is on the how much greater is what God has done through Christ than what Adam has done. So, though this is the great passage about original sin, that's not really Paul's focus. It's a comparison between Adam and Christ and how Christ more than offsets the calamity that was brought about by Adam's sin. Nonetheless, this is the passage where more than any other passage in the New Testament, we find Paul talking about Adam's sin and the consequences that it bore for human beings. What Paul is doing here in effect is taking a theme which he introduced very briefly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and expanding upon it. And that, let me say, is typical of Romans. What Paul does over and over again in Romans is take something which he has introduced in one of his other epistles and pick it up in Romans and expand upon it, develop it in Romans. Perhaps it's because those other letters were written to churches that he knew about and was responding to particular problems there. He doesn't know what's going on in Rome so much. He's never been there. A lot of the people there he's never met, though some he has. And so he's summing up, really, in Romans, a whole lot of things that he had written in other letters. And what he wrote very briefly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 was that, um, as by one man sin came into... The... Nope, now I'm quoting Romans 5. Let me get this right. I should just quote it from Handel's Messiah, but it's slipping my mind at the moment. Okay. As by one man sin came into the world, and death by sin. No, as by a man came death. <laughs> Sorry, let me take this from the top. As by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be all be made alive. One man brought death, the other man, Adam brought death, in Christ comes the resurrection from the dead. But as Adam was a human being who brought death, so Christ had to become, God's son had to become a human being to offset the calamitous effects of Adam's sin to bring life. That, in a nutshell, is something that Paul's going to develop at more length in Romans chapter 5. Now, just a further introductory word here. I had never intended to write a commentary on Romans, and that wasn't my thought. I accepted the invitation to do so because this particular series deals a lot with the history of interpretation, and I thought that was a new angle. That's something worth exploring. Otherwise, one more commentary on Romans is hardly needed, but if this has a different angle, a different perspective, then maybe it would be worthwhile, so I took it on. Having said that, you can see how when you come to Romans 5 and original sin, the history of interpretation is enormous. And so in the commentary, I have an excursus, and it's important that it's an excursus, I'll come back to that in a minute, where I deal with the early church fathers and how they understood original sin, the Greek fathers, and Augustine, who understood it very differently. And then the traditional Catholic understanding of original sin. And then the Reformers and their understanding of original sin. The Anabaptists, the Wesleyans, and so on. All this in an excursus because different traditions have responded, have understood it differently, interpreted it in very different ways. I'm not going to go into any of that tonight. It's in an excursus because it's going beyond what Paul actually says. And in a church Bible study, we're interested in what Paul has to say. We're not here to inform curiosity about the many different ways in which people have expanded upon it. So all that that's in an excursus, I'm going to omit tonight, and we're simply going to look at what Paul has to say. But you'll see why 
people have explored the question further and gone in very different directions. It's because Paul says things in a very tantalizing way and doesn't work them out. And he doesn't work them out because that's not his focus. But he raises questions that then different traditions have expanded upon, have tried to explain in different ways. For example, and I'll come back to this a little later, the primary question that people wonder is, Paul says that Adam sinned, and because Adam sinned, we all became sinners. That's what he says, and that's the truth that he wants to get across. What he does not say is, how does Adam's sin make us sinners? And that is, quite, of course, the kind of question that theologians want to know the answer to. Paul, it's fine to say Adam sinned, so we all became sinners, but how did that happen? And so different traditions explain it in different ways. Very quickly, I'll explain, I'll mention the two brief ways, but the point is, again, neither of this does Paul say. These are attempts by Christians theologians, serious attempts by serious people trying to understand what's here in Romans 5, but going beyond what Paul says to try and explain how it is that if Adam sinned, we all became sinners. And two of the ways in which this is explained, one is referred to as the realistic way. And by that is meant somehow, and Augustine went to great lengths trying to explain this, but we'll just leave it, somehow Adam's nature was so corrupted that his seed passed on to all his descendants was corrupted also. Somehow in the, pos in, the, in the process of having descendants who are descended from him, Adam's seed is passed on to them and in some realistic but curious way, the corruption of Adam's human nature was realistically passed on from his seed to all his descendants. That's the realistic explanation, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. The alternative way raised primarily by the reformers, though they, some of them go into the realistic way as well. The primary way in which the reformers explained it is the representative view. And that is simply that Adam is the great representative of human beings as their forefather, so that what applies to him applies to those whom he represents as well. Not necessarily something transmitted physically through the seed, but simply because if you're representing a group of people and you make a certain decision, it's going to affect all those people as well. If a prime minister declares war, everybody in the country is, is in a state of war because our representatives have done that. And so the second view is that Adam, as our representative, has sinned, become a sinner. And that applies to us as well because he represents us. Those are attempts to explain how it can happen that because Adam sinned, we all became sinners. My point here is that that's speculation. In both cases, it's speculation that's going beyond what Scripture says. Now, it is natural for human curiosity to want some explanation, so we try to come up with these things, and if they're helpful, you can, you can take them. But they're going beyond Scripture, and our focus tonight is simply going to be on what Paul actually says, and then we're going to leave the how did that happen to theologians to worry about, or you to worry about in another context if you're interested. But let's start then with verse 12, Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, through Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Let's, let's pause there for a minute and just take verse 12 because there's enough to chew on there. We have all learned that when you come across a therefore in Scripture, you're supposed to ask, what is it there for, Right? The problem is that nobody's been able to figure out what this therefore is there for. There doesn't seem to be any obvious connection between saying that we've received in Christ the reconciliation and saying by one man sin came into the world. So it's not clear what the therefore means here. My suggestion, but all anybody can do is make suggestions, is that this is not tied immediately uh, to what comes immediately before it, but to Paul's whole argument up to this point. In other words, in 
Chapters 1 to 3, basically, Paul is talking about how human beings fell into sin through our ungodliness, through our unrighteousness, so that we're all sinners before God. And then in chapter 3, 21 to the end of chapter 4, also in chapter 5, the beginning, he talks about how Christ has just made justification possible for us, made it possible for us to be back in God's good books. So the whole argument from Romans 1 to 5 is about how we fell into sin and how Christ puts us right. And what Paul is saying with therefore here is, now I'm going to say the same thing, make the same point, about how human beings fell into sin and how they can be put right, but I'm going to put it in different terms. I talked about it first, just about in general terms, how human beings fell into sin. Now I'm going to trace it back to human beings' forefather, Adam. And before I talked about how Christ died as the atonement for our sins, the redemption for our sins, now I'm going to talk about how his obedience offset Adam's disobedience. So I think that therefore, this is my best guess, is to say, now I'm going to sum up everything I've said up to this point, but in different language. How humanity fell into sin, how we are found righteous again. Therefore, as, by one, as sin came into the world through one man, sin came into the world through one man means that before Adam sinned, sin was not in the world. And of course, that's just making the point that we see over and over again in Genesis chapter 1. What God made was good, what God made was good, what God made was good, what God made was very good. It's all very good, and sin is not in the world as God created it. Sin is brought into the world, introduced into the world, by humanity's sin. And of course, all the consequences of sin follow from that. But for the moment, sin came into the world, came into a good world, a world created good by our Creator, came into the world through one man, and death through sin. Okay, God didn't make us for death, we're made for life with him. But if we're going to sin, if we're going to alienate ourselves from God, then death is the inevitable result. One way of putting it, and if this is helpful, take it. If it doesn't, forget it is to say that human beings are contingent beings. By that I mean that we don't necessarily exist. There was a time when I didn't exist. There will be a time when, as a human, physical embodied human being, I will not exist. And there's no necessary reason why I should come to exist. I'm a contingent being. My whole existence is dependent on God and on the process of a history that brought me into being. God is not a contingent being. The language of John chapter 5, verse 26 has it this way. God has life in himself, and the Son has life in himself. Okay, I don't have life in myself. If I have life as a contingent being, it's because I've received it from others. God has life in himself. It's not contingent on anyone else. He is just the source of all life. And if God is the source of all life, and our life is dependent on him because we're contingent beings, and we have alienated ourselves from the source of life by our sin, then death is the inevitable result. By one man, sin came into the world, and once sin alienated us from the source of life on whose life we are dependent for our lives, then death follows from sin. Now, Paul's next line is another case of Paul having his cake and eating it too, which is something he does frequently. And let me make the point here because it's an important point. What Paul goes on to say in the last, last part of verse 12 is, so death passed to all men because all sin. Why do we all die? Because we all sin. All right, that makes perfect sense, except that in a couple verses later on, Paul's going to say we all die because Adam sinned. Look at verse 15. The free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass. What's he saying there? He's saying we all died because of Adam's trespass. He's going to repeat that a little bit later on. But in verse 12, he says we all die because we sin. Death passed to all men because all men sinned. Well, which is it? Both. 
And I think Paul's point is this. There's a tendency of human beings to say, it's not my fault, it's Adam's. And what Paul is saying, yes, Adam sinned, and with his sin, we all became sinners and we all die, but we all ratify Adam's choice by our own sins. We can't pass the buck off onto Adam because we sin ourselves, and our, our death can be seen indifferently as the result of our sin or as the result of Adam's sin. We become mortal through Adam's sin, but we sin ourselves and our death can be seen as punishment for our own sin. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about death as the consequence of Adam's sin, but in Romans chapter 1, it's the consequence of our own sin. They do these things knowing the fact that God's judgment for them is death if they do these things. So death is our punishment, our deserved punishment for our sins. At the same time, it is a punishment imposed on human beings because of Adam's sin. We become mortal, we die because of Adam's sin, and yet we can't blame it on him because we repeat Adam's choice in our own lives. We sin ourselves. Death passed to all men because all sinned. Now, verses 13 and 14, and we may conclude with these tonight, but they're a little bit of a parenthesis. Paul is going to pick, he started to say something in verse 12 that he doesn't really finish his sentence, and that's not unusual for the inspired apostle. In verse 15, he'll pick up what he started in verse 12, but he answers an objection in verses 13 and 14. Paul, how can you say that all sinned when the people between Adam and Moses didn't have a law that they could break? Obviously, Adam sinned because God told him, don't eat from that tree, and Adam ate from that tree. He broke God's command. He sinned. He ought not to have done that. Okay, Moses comes along. God gives us his law through Moses, and if you break that law, then you've sinned. You deserve to die. But what about the period between Adam and Moses? They weren't given the law. How can you say that they, are, that they sinned, and how can you say that they died because of their sin, all sinned and they died because of their sin, if they didn't have a law to break. And in brief, the point Paul makes is that there is a difference between sin and transgression. A difference between sin and transgression. The difference is this. Sin is any wrong that you do. Transgression is a breaking of a law. Okay? That means that all transgression is sin, but not all sin is transgression, okay? Adam sinned and transgressed. His transgression, his sin was a transgression because he had been told explicitly what he ought not to do, and he transgressed that command, so he sinned and he transgressed. God gives us the law, says, thou shalt not murder. If you murder, you've sinned, and you've also transgressed. But Cain didn't have that law. Did he sin when he killed his brother? Yes. He sinned, but he didn't transgress. Okay, there was lots of adultery going on between, uh, between Adam and Moses. Was it sin when people committed adultery? Yes, it was. But it wasn't a transgression because they hadn't been given the command, thou shalt not transgress. And here's a very crucial point. When God said, you shall not kill, he did not make something innocent into something wrong. Killing was wrong already. God was just spelling out what is by nature wrong. When God says, you shall not steal, you shall not commit adultery, he's not making adultery wrong as though it was okay before, but now you must not do it. No, God's law spells out what we already know because God has written these truths on our heart. We already know something of the distinction between good and evil, and the law just spells it out in unmistakable terms. So the people between Adam and Moses still sinned, and they rightly died because of their sin, and yet they did not transgress. So that's what Paul is saying. Let me just read that. Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. Transgression wasn't in the world, but sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. 
By that, I would take it to mean something like sin is still sin, but it's not a legal offense. Um, a legal offense is only when you break the law, right? But you can still do wrong without breaking the law. And in fact, people do a whole lot of things that are wrong that may not necessarily be breaking the law. And Paul is saying their sin was not counted against them as legal offenses, but they were still sins and they still died because of their sin. Death reigned from Adam to Moses because these people were sinning, even though they were not transgressing a law they had not been given. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. That is, they didn't have a law to transgress, but they were still sinning. So death reigned over them. They were still subject to death as the punishment for their sin, even though their sins were not transgressions as Adam's was. And Adam was a type of the one who was to come, of Christ who was to come. Adam decisively impacts human history in one way. Christ decisively impacts human history in a different way. So Adam is a type of foreshadowing of Christ, even though the decisive way in which they impact human history is to opposite effect. Adam brings them into sin and condemnation and death. Christ brings, brings us into justification and righteousness and life. Just one other verse to underline the point we've just seen, and then we'll have to call it for this evening. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. The law brings wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. To see how that's making the same point? There is sin without law, but there is not transgression. And what the law brings is transgression. It turns sin into transgression. And we could jump ahead for just a minute. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The law came in to increase the trespass. There were sins already before the law came, but the law made it worse. How does it make it worse? Because it turns into a transgression. A kid may know in the back of his head that he's not really supposed to touch those cookies up there, but he wants to touch them anyway. So he goes and takes them. He's doing something he knows he shouldn't do. He's sinning. What if his mother had told him 30 seconds before, Danny, don't touch those cookies. And then he goes and touches them. He, had already, he was already sinning if he took them without his mom saying it, but now it's much worse because now it is not only the sin of taking cookies that he should not take, but now it's an open act of rebellion against what his mother had just told him. And that's what Paul says the law does. It doesn't make sin sin because sin is already sin without the law, but it makes it into something still worse. It makes it into not only the wrong of doing the wrong, but an open act of rebellion against God because God has told you not to do it and you go ahead and do it anyway. Sin makes the transgression even worse. Well, that's a lousy note to end on, but... <laughs> But rather than launch into Romans 5, 15 to 19, I think we'll, we'll call it there for an evening and, uh, and perhaps be picked up by what uh, Josh does with us now. And trust we've learned something from Romans 5 anyway. Thank you.